All right, ResinFem, I know a lot of you have been anxiously waiting for this video, but for those of you who aren't caught up to what I've been up to, I'm gonna show you in this video how I took an OG AnyCubic Photon and overclocked it by tossing on a monochrome screen and stupidly overpowered light source and gotten down to one second cure times. My name's Yasu. I'm a costume maker who pivoted in the middle of a pandemic to start Liquid RFX, which is an online store that focuses on selling resin printed miniatures for a variety of tabletop games. I also run this YouTube channel, Hiro Creations, where I share with you everything I've learned about resin printing as well as showing you really neat things I've discovered and built within the realm of 3D printing. So anyways, let's get into the video. So in the last couple months, we've seen uh, new releases like the Frozen Sonic Mini, uh, the Frozen Sonic 4K, the Anycubic Mono X, the Mono SE, the Eligu Pro 2, the Eligu Saturn, and a myriad of other monochrome 3D printers. Unfortunately, inventory levels are really tight, and it's an early generation product that I'm sure has a fair number of bugs that will need to be worked out. So I decide, instead of jumping on the bandwagon and putting in a pre-order and having to wait a fair amount of time to get my mono printer. Why don't I go out, get some mono screens, get some other parts, and actually convert one of my existing printers that has been dead for the better part of a year and do something cool. Hence, this crazy project. Probably somewhat inadvisable because I did spend a fair amount and put in a lot of work, but it's something I can uniquely call my own. So. I present to you, for your consideration, how I overclocked an OG AnyCubic Photon printer and turned it into a mono powerhouse. So a couple points before we get started. This mod is what I like to call a warranty breaker. That is, undergoing any part of this warranty will spectacularly shatter any warranty that your AnyCubic Photon has. Now granted, the AnyCubic Photon is at this point a pretty old printer, but who knows, you might have bought one brand new and you want to trade up. Just remember, this is going to void the warranty and nobody's going to be around to support you. So do this at your own risk. The other thing to, get to note is that this guide is just going to be a general overview. I'm not going to go blow by blow on showing you every little screw of how it goes, you know, comes apart and goes together. Um, it's, this mod really is as simple as it gets as far as mods go, you know, considering how involved and how much you're changing because it's the, the board, everything is nearly identical. You don't have to solder anything. You don't have to crimp anything. It's just unplug and replug in with the new components. So more or less the point of this video is to give you an idea of the entire process and how things go together in their rough steps without necessarily talking about where each screw goes because that would be an hour long and not really fun to watch. So I definitely recommend having some comfort, having some familiarity with modding machines. If you're not comfortable with it, definitely don't do this mod. But if you've, say, taken apart an ender and put it back together again, or you've changed a hot end, or you've done anything else with FDM printers or other electronics, then you'll probably be relatively comfortable and find this project easy to do. Anyways, those points before we jump straight into the process. For this build, you're going to need the following parts. A Chitu Board LV3 from CBD Tech, a CBD Tech 6 inch 2K monochrome screen, a duo bond 6 inch LED array, a duo bond LED driver, this usually comes bundled with the LED array, two 24 volt 40 millimeter fans for cooling the LED array, and a 60 millimeter fan for cooling the rest of the enclosure. Additionally, we're gonna have to print a few parts. You can either do this with high temperature PLA plus or my preference and recommendation, PETG you will want to avoid using ABS or ASA, which unfortunately have a nasty habit of breaking apart and deteriorating when exposed to liquid resin. Now I've linked the full parts list in the description down below. Some of those links are affiliate links where I earn a small commission if you buy using them. So if you really wanna support this channel and help me do more crazy ambitious conversions or builds, I'd greatly appreciate your support. Doesn't cost you anything or anything extra, but it helps uh, give me a little more funding to do some crazy stuff in the future. 
First, we gotta effectively gut the entire printer like it's in going out of business sale. Everything must go. Out goes the board, the light source, the screen, even the top plate that holds the screen. In the end, you're left with a hollowed out chassis and a few miscellaneous wires that handle the power and the USB cables. As I mentioned before, there's gonna be a few parts that's gonna be need to be printed in order to make this work, which I've uploaded to a GitHub as an open source project. Once the screen plate has been separated from the chassis, you will want to remove the motor lead screw assembly and then remove the z-axis. Now please don't be me and actually wear protective gloves on this step. As the lead screw and the z-axis is saturated with a ton of grease and is rather messy to handle without gloves. After that you will want to remove the carbon fiber filter and fan assembly. If you're lucky and take good care of your machine, it will be clean and resin free and usable for your mod. If you're unlucky, like me, then it will be pre-saturated with resin and pretty much only good to be thrown away. The carbon filter is honestly an optional thing and you probably won't see much change in your performance not having it, especially if your workspace is well ventilated. While you're taking it all apart, be sure to label and keep all the screws and hardware in a place where it won't get lost. At the end of it all, the screen is all that's left. You're free to either leave the screen as is or remove it and repurpose it for another project. It's your call. If you've ever had a resin overflow or a splash, then there's likely be uncured resin on parts of the machine. You'll really want to take your time with and use some alcohol to clean all the parts thoroughly. At this step, you should be left with a hollowed out chassis and the power and USB related wiring, which stays and gets used in the new machine. At this juncture, we'll be doing all the things we did to disassemble the parent, but in reverse with the new parts. Start by putting the Z-axis linear guides back on the new printed plate. Then screw in the lead screw motor. Keep the build plate holder at the top of the printer. It keeps things easy for you later on. If your FDM printer is well tuned and there's no support remnants on the printed parts, then the screen plate should slide in nicely, but stay snug with no play. The screw holes where you secure the plate is set so that the stock metric screws that originally were used on the printer can easily thread securely into the plastic, so you don't have to mess about with any inserts or different hardware. So not shown here, but you really want to mount the control board on the printed screen holder before you insert it into the enclosure because it's a whole lot more trouble to try to wrangle in a very tight area with your hands. It's just, it was a pain. If you're having trouble getting the plate to fit, you may have to tweak the settings on your printer for better dimensional accuracy. If there are small differences in the printed part, you can easily file it down with a metal rasp. Now let's talk electronics for a moment. The Cheetah Board LV3 has an identical layout for all the connectors compared to the stock board. This makes changing them very easy with no soldering or crimping necessary, which is a really refreshing break from other printer mods. In the description below, I've also included a link to the Cheetah Board manual where there is a handy wiring guide showing what goes where if you have any uncertainty. Now let's talk about the light source for a moment. We're swapping the central COB and reflector array with a much stronger 24 volt parallel LED array with collimator lenses. Now that sounds like a mouthful, but it's really necessary to take, really take advantage of the larger screen area and to evenly distribute light so you get crisper prints. But it does need a dedicated mount to effectively hold it and to hold the cooling fans that keep the light source cool which is where the second print part comes in handy for you. Now you will need a few extra bits of hardware, including a pair of M5 square nuts, a pair of M5 by 15 millimeter bolts, M5 washers, and lastly, a pair of M4 by 10 millimeter bolts. First up, you'll want to secure the rack so it lays flat on the bottom of the metal casing. Then secure it using the M5 by 15 uh, bolts and the uh, square nuts that you have to hold it to the metal casing. Once secure, you can slide in the light source so that the top of the heatsink rests underneath the holding lip on the right side of the printer. Make sure the wiring is also on the right side. 
then screw in the M4 screws into the threaded inserts on the heatsink in order to secure it. Take a moment to connect the light source into the boost converter and connect the fans into the always on motherboard fan port. Here's an overhead shot that you can pause to sort of see where everything's at. Apologies for the poor wire management in this shot. All right, and the final logical step is to insert a new six inch mono screen. There's a nice little indent where the screen is supposed to go that allows it to lay flush in relation to the rest of the plate. In terms of connection, it's pretty straightforward and simple as it shares the same connector type as your standard 5.5 inch screens that you'd find on your LEDU Mars or some of the newer um, Anycubic Photons. There's a set of little numbers on either side of the connector as well as the ribbon cable of your screen. Simply match up those numbers and connect them. Once you've verified that you've reconnected everything the way it should be into the control board, you're free to carefully lift up the case and gently lower it onto the bottom part of the enclosure and bolt the two parts together. And boom, you should have a machine that is good to start testing. Remember, always do dry testing before doing anything with actual resin to make sure there are no bugs or mistakes made in any of the prior steps. The firmware preload on the Chitty board looks nearly identical to what you'd find on the Mars or the Photon. So you really don't have to worry about rooting around any parameters and changing anything. It's good to go. However, there is a handy G-code file which I have linked in the description below that allows you to change most aspects of the machine and how it functions. Keep in mind, I'm in the early stages of stress testing this mod, but so far I'm incredibly happy with how it goes. And that is how I overclocked my Anycubic Photon and turned it into a blazing fast, one second per layer, highly precise machine. If you found this video useful and helpful in your resin printing, feel free to hit that like button and smash that subscribe button. You know, the notification bell and all those other things that the YouTubers love to say. Um, it does actually really help my channel grow and allows me to do crazier and crazier builds and keep expanding uh, the knowledge base of resin printing because we're still, this is the early days. This is like 2015 for uh, FDM printing. So anyways, thank you for watching. See you in the next video.